uh, welcome everyone to the closing panel. It's uh, the last, but certainly not the last, uh, particularly given the subject or the light of the subject we'll be discussing. And looking at Russia's potential futures, I suppose you could put it in plural, and its impact or their impact on European security, especially, I would say, along Russia's many borders, not just with Ukraine, but other potentially vulnerable states. And I would like to start by posing one fundamental question for all of our panelists. Please hush. And the question is this. What is better and ultimately safer for Europe, a strong Russia or a weak Russia? Presumably, I would say the ideal solution would be the end of Putinism as an authoritarian neo-imperial system uh, and the formation or the consolidation of a genuinely democratic Russia, a, gen a, a genuinely federalized Russia within its current borders with no aspirations to neighboring states uh, and so on and so forth, all the good things in life. However, it seems to me political leaders in Moscow uh, and indeed much of the public, and even maybe some of the opposition, may view such a state as weak, as uh, not in line with Russian tradition, and as potentially unstable. Uh, and even more importantly, I would say, there doesn't seem to be sufficient impetus for a democratic transformation within Russia itself, at least not now. A second solution, a second alternative that Russia may confront uh, is an increasingly failing state with weakening institutions, but also with unrequited imp imperial ambitions and rising nationalism. This would generate, I think, new conflicts with neighbors, as well as with Western capitals and institutions. It can also stimulate internal rifts and conflicts between Russia's numerous ethnic groups and diverse regions. And in such a scenario, I would say Russia simultaneously experiences expansion and contraction. Uh, imperial ambition and anti-imperial resistance, a sort of, I would say, volatile dying star from a supernova to a red dwarf, and the recipe for permanent international conflict. I mean, that's my six cents, five cents, whatever it's worth. So I'm going to introduce the panelists very, very briefly to consider Russia's future and particularly the regional and international implications of such future. We have four well-known futurologists, uh, with this time ladies last for a change. You're going to go last, Melissa. <laughs> we'll, we'll, start with a, we'll start with Carl Bildt, uh, Sweden's former Minister of Foreign Affairs, followed by uh, Mark, Michael Carpenter, Special Advisor to the uh, US VP for Europe and Russia, followed by Mikhail Kasyanov, former Prime Minister of Russia, and, of course, our very own, now at Brookings Institute, Lilia Shevtsova. So uh, let's begin with Carl. And uh, let me just say five, seven minutes, more or less. I know you have to leave early. So. More or less, and uh, hopefully less, since I'm sorry that I will have to catch a flight to Riga and then onward to another part of, of Europe. But just some, um, starting with some more general comments, because um, needless to say, we're going to focus on Russia, we're going to focus on Ukraine, but we need to see the perspective of security for Europe as a whole go back uh, slightly more than 10 years in time when we were launching the European security strategy and European neighborhood policy and the ambition good as it was was to develop instruments in order to seek to achieve that Europe was surrounded by what we call a wing of friends be that in the east or be that in the south we now 2015 after this watershed year of 2014 find ourselves in a situation where Europe is not supported by a wing of friends, but by a wing of fire. And that fire is burning in the south and is burning in the east. The south should not be forgotten when we discuss the uh, security pressures that are there on Europe and on European societies. We face what also others have described as the possibility of a 30 years war in the North Africa, Middle East part of the world. And I think that comparison is appropriate because it is the same combination of sectarian divisions of which we understand very little. Very few people today can understand the killing 
sectarian that went on for 30 years in Europe, 500 years ago either. But there was quite a number of proxy wars and quite a number of them. And much the same thing has happened with the Thirty Years' War. When all of these fires had started all over Europe, sectarian and proxy wars and whatever, it was so difficult to get an end to it. It wasn't the war that lasted for 30 years. It was the difficulties of closing down the wars eventually into the Peace of Westphalia in 1648. That's roughly, I fear, what we are facing in the South. Refugee streams to Europe increased last year by 170%. A lot of those are people that are genuinely in need of help. But there's some other things coming in those boats as well. And there is inspiration that results in what we saw in Paris. I'm just saying this so that we have the perspective on the security challenge and threat that is felt somewhat differently in the different capitals of Europe, but it's felt all over in different ways. Towards the east, of course, there's Russia. And uh, Vilnius is a good place to discuss it. I was on this platform uh, the last time at the Vilnius Summit, the famous of the Eastern Partnership Summit. And I, and I still have that vivid recollection, the picture in my mind, when we left the hall, and I was among fairly late leaving the hall, and I was standing there with President Gabaskaut and a couple of others, and uh, the man who was last to leave the hall was President Yanukovych. And when he came, we thought that he was going to stop and say goodbye or something like that. The president was the president and host of the summit, so it would have been not entirely inappropriate. But we saw him rushing by with fear in his face. And he refused to meet even the Ukrainian journalist. He knew what he was going to face when he went back. That was the beginning of Maidan. And today is January 16th. That was the day when he introduced in Kiev the package of repressive laws that they hardly had time to translate from Russian into Ukrainian because they were coming from Moscow, all of them, in order to do the suppression of the Maidan. That failed, and the rest, as they say, is history. Putin moved in, and we can discuss how much of that was designed and how much was opportunistic, I think, it was to a large extent, from Russia's point of view, a policy driven by fear rather than anything else. They feared that something was coming out of Kiev that was going to be dangerous for them. In the famous March 18 speech in the Kremlin, Putin talked about the spect of NATO soldiers taking over in Sevastopol. That seemed rather far-fetched, and I don't think that is what drove the policy. He feared far more peaceful demonstrators in Moscow as a result of what was happening in Kiev than he feared NATO soldiers marching into Sevastopol. I would argue that he feared Maidan more than he feared NATO. And at the end of the day, that is what drove the reaction and drove the policy. The um, Russia that we're facing now is the geopolitical terms openly declared revisionist. It's not only that we are saying that they are. It's academic analysis. They are openly revisionist in their speeches, in their proposal, and changing borders in a way we have not been confronted with in Europe for decades, and that is dangerous. But they are also, in my opinion, there's a double challenge. The geopolitical revisionist challenge and the ideological reactionary challenge. This is the Russia of Nicholas I coming back. The uh, spearhead of reactionary forces trying to preserve regimes that are under threat from forces in society that they fear are going to have a detrimental effect on their future. And we see that in the uh, ideological approach taken. We discuss Russian propaganda or whatever. But, but there is an ideological thrust there. The reactionary against modern, secular, liberal 
societies and playing on what are fears also within our societies and we need to deal with both the revisionist geopolitical challenge and the ideological reactionary challenge. Which then are the policy conclusion? We discussed that earlier. But in my opinion, leaving the South aside for the time being, Ukraine is of course the key. And I think the outcome of Ukraine will define the future of Russia and that will have a profound impact on the future of all of Europe. This will not come easily and this will not come fast and it will not come without strong support and determination from our side. We can discuss policies of weakening Russia. I don't think we can do better than Mr. Putin is doing himself. We should concentrate our policies on supporting and strengthening Ukraine. Do that in political terms, and that's a question of helping in Ukraine itself, but also giving the political support by, in our respective countries, underlining how important it is on the diplomatic battlefront all over the world to explain what's going on. We need to give far better financial support to pre prevent the collapse that I'm quite certain that some people in Moscow are hoping will happen so that they, they one way or the other, can start to meddle in the meltdown of the Ukrainian financial system. That needs to be prevented, and that needs primarily to be done by the Ukrainians themselves, by their reforms. But it will not be without financial support from our side. The figures that are necessary are big, but minute, if you compare them to the money that we have been committed to Greece, cradle of democracy, nice country, sunny, whatever, but I would argue, and, and good, hope they succeed, blah, blah. But Ukraine is another order of magnitude when it comes to importance. And then security, needless to say. I, I, I don't believe that there is necessarily that much that needs to be done in that particular respect. Some things need to be done. But it's not that there is a lack of weaponry in uh, Ukraine all over the ex-Soviet space as an abundance of weapons, but can't, people can't really use them. And they need to devise clever, clever political security strategies in order to cope with the internal security challenge. And that might be sort of software support that we might be able to give. So that's where we are. We are sitting in Europe surrounded by a ring of fire, revisionist and reactionary Russia in the East, but Ukraine is the center of the game, and we must engage strongly with uh, persistence and with patience and with strength, understanding that that is going to what be what decides the outcome of security in the East. Uh, thanks for that overview, Carl. Uh, just a logistical question. Are you staying till the end of the panel? <laughs> no, okay, let, let, me, let me jump in and ask you a question. You mentioned helping, obviously, strengthening uh, Ukraine, making sure it's a success, making sure it stays an uh, integrated state and so on and moves towards European Union. What about helping Russian democracy? How do you see that? I mean, what can we do to help Russian civic society, the opposition, uh, potentially strengthen, let's say, its European future? Well, I mean, that... Two, good, two far better experts on that. Uh, but I think discussions like this, I mean, engaging, uh, engaging with Russia is very important. Individual Russians, Russian society, uh, to a certain extent, Russian economy. I, I think sanctions are good. Uh, I think, that was, to be quite honest, there are sanctions that turned out to be fairly stupid. Uh, we stopped the EBRD, financing of small and medium-sized enterprises in Russia. I'm not quite certain why we did that. I think that was profoundly stupid. Um, of course, we, we have an interest in the long-term uh, build-up of the middle class and all of that in Russia as a part of that transformation. The engagement with Russian society, um, and there are different ways of doing that. It's not a question of handing out money. Uh, Russia is a rich country, but it's a question of supporting in different other ways. Okay. Thank you, Carl. Let's, uh, 
let's cross the Atlantic and give Michael the floor now. Um, again, five, five, seven minutes if you can. Thank you. Um, as I was thinking about the title of the panel and, and Russia's futures, there's obviously a, a whole host of different variables that will impact uh, Russia's future development. Some of them are exogenous, such as the price of oil. Some of them are internal, having to do with leader, leadership dynamics and rifts within the elite. Um, but I think that the most credible scenario that we have to contend with uh, today is essentially the baseline one, uh, that Russia continues on its current course. Uh, and what that means is that internally uh, within Russia, the suppression of dissent that we've seen uh, pick up over the last two years continues and accelerates. We've seen this against the venerable NGOs like Memorial, uh, Committee of Soldiers' Mothers. We've seen the revival of horrific practices from the Soviet era such as the use of psychiatric hospitals uh, to quash dissent. Uh, we've seen aggressive patrolling of the Internet to such an extent that uh, there was a report, uh, I think, last week of uh, a Russian woman in Yekaterinburg who was simply reposting Western news stories on Ukraine on her blog, uh, which earned her uh, an immediate investigation from the investigative committee. So I think we can uh, count on, on seeing more of that. I think we can count on the fact that Russia's uh, kleptocracy, which they have perfected to an art form, uh, will continue. Uh, you will see that the economy, which has remained uh, completely dependent on export of hydrocarbon resources, uh, will remain so. There is no effort underway, despite the rhetoric, to actually diversify the economy. And Russia's foreign policy uh, is likely to continue to be defined by a desire to establish uh, a permanent sphere of influence uh, in the countries of the former Soviet Union. That's the baseline scenario. That's the current course that we're on. What are the implications of this? Uh, in Ukraine, I believe the implications are that Russia doubles down. Uh, I think that Russian support for the proxies will continue in the east, uh, I am convinced that they will uh, seek, that the Kremlin will seek to have the conflict in the East continue uh, on a low boil or a simmer uh, so as to signal to markets that the Ukrainian economy is turbulent uh, and to try and undermine that economy. I think there's no coincidence in the fact that uh, Finance Minister Silovanov commented on the possibility of calling in Russia's $3 billion debt on the eve of an announcement by Ukraine of its reserve numbers. That was calculated, obviously. Um, and I think in the, in the, on the periphery of Russia, the pressure on, on the states on the periphery will continue. In Georgia, we've seen these new treaties uh, with the so-called republics of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Uh, and Moscow is clearly signaling to Tbilisi that if they move further to the West on their quest for either NATO membership or EU uh, association, that the specter of annexation for those two regions uh, is there. Uh, similarly, in Moldova, another vulnerable country, I think we can expect to see that uh, pressure uh, in the form of disturbances within Transnistria, within Gaugazia, within the Moldovan economy, which is dominated by Russian interests, uh, will continue. Um, in terms of Russia's uh, adherence to international obligations, uh, we can expect to see Russia continue on this path where it is completely unmoored uh, from its international obligations, not only international norms such as those codified in the UN Charter, the Helsinki Final Act, uh, or even more specifically in documents like the Budapest Memorandum that pertains to Ukraine, but even in agreements that Russia has made uh, just in the last uh, several months or years. Uh, so, for example, this treaty with Abkhazia and South Ossetia undermines the commitments that Russia made to Georgia bilaterally uh, in the agreement that allowed Russia to enter the WTO. Similarly, the Minsk agreement, uh, what the signature of the Russian ambassador on that uh, is only a few months old and already Russia is showing that it has absolutely no desire whatsoever 
uh, to honor uh, its commitments there. And it's worth remembering, I think, also the, the so-called Sarkozy ceasefire in Georgia, uh, whose six points uh, remain to be fulfilled to this day. Um, in terms of Russia's economy, obviously the implications are continued decline. The turbulence is there. Uh, foreign direct investment has dried up to a halt. Um, capital flight uh, last year, $130 billion. Uh, the World Bank just came out with numbers, 2.9% uh, decline predicted for this year. And as a result of that, I think we can continue to see jockeying among the Russian elites for a shrinking economic pie. And the Yevtushenko uh, house arrest, he just came out and said he's so grateful that he's out. Well, uh, I'm sure he is. But this is a symptom of, uh, I think, more to come in terms of uh, what Churchill called the bulldogs under the rug. Uh, fighting with each other for, as I said, a shrinking economic pie. And then lastly, the implication is that the rhetoric, uh, the extreme anti-Americanism, which we've seen since Putin's return uh, to the Kremlin, and more generally the, the strident anti-Western uh, rhetoric uh, will continue uh, unabated. So how to cope with uh, a Russia uh, that continues on this course? Um, I think uh, a couple things. Uh, I have six points I want to make in this regard. First, I think it's imperative that the U.S. and the EU, or more broadly, the U.S. and uh, the European countries remain united, uh, not just in terms of the sanctions, as has been uh, discussed before, and preventing the rollback of those sanctions that we have in place, but also in terms of signaling, and I think this is critical, signaling that if Putin takes further escalatory steps in eastern Ukraine, and we've seen it within the last week. Don't take my word for it. Take uh, General Breedlove's uh, word for it. There is still heavy equipment going into Ukraine. Mercenaries continue to flow into eastern Ukraine. If that continues, there should be increased costs uh, on Russia, but they have to be uh, increased costs that are imposed by both uh, the U.S. and Canada on the one hand and by our European friends on the other. Second point. We need to straight, strengthen NATO's core mission. Uh, I think the, the Wales Summit did a good job uh, of putting in place the readiness action plan. Uh, from a bilateral perspective, I think the United States needs to be committed for the near term, uh, at a minimum, to a persistent presence in this part of the world, the frontline states uh, of NATO. Uh, and we also need to develop new tools to deal with hybrid warfare. Hybrid warfare or whatever term you want to use, is not going away. We need to perfect the tools that we use uh, both within NATO uh, and outside of NATO to deal with this. Third point, we need to support Ukraine. Uh, there is a immediate need for financial assistance. Uh, Ukraine's macroeconomic situation is perilous. Uh, thank you, Carl. It's, uh, I almost was going to refuse to be on the panel when I learned I was going to follow Carl Bildt. Um, uh, but, uh, but Ukraine faces a, a daunting uh, challenge, uh, financial, reform, anti-corruption. They're on the right path, but seeing them through is going to be critical, uh, and it's not just going to involve money. It's going to be uh, folks on the ground in Kyiv, in the provinces, working every day to make sure that the reform program that's been put forward is actually implemented. And not just in Ukraine, but also on Russia's periphery. We need to stand with Georgia, Moldova, the other states that are interested in seeking Western support uh, uh, to firm them up and to strengthen their sovereignty. Fourth point, we need to diminish Russia's use of energy as a weapon. Finally, I think the wake-up call has been delivered numerous times. Now is the time for Europe to get serious about energy security. Uh, the United States is certainly willing to help but this is fundamentally a European issue uh, with investment in public goods like interconnectors, LNG terminals, storage facility, so on and so forth. Fifth, uh, the, the basis for our strength as NATO, uh, as a transatlantic alliance, is rooted fundamentally in our economics and in our economic strength and continued growth. And so in this regard, TTIP uh, and strengthening of the transatlantic bond on trade and investment is critical to our capacity to defend ourselves uh, and to project power uh, in Europe and beyond. 
And then finally, the sixth point I would make in terms of coping with the Russia that we see today with the current trajectory is keeping faith with Russian civil society, uh, which is under tremendous assault, uh, keeping faith with the Russian people. Uh, they are also uh, bearing a very heavy brunt uh, for uh, Mr. Putin's current policies. Uh, and we need to remember that there will come a day uh, when he is no longer the leader of Russia, uh, and we need to prepare uh, for that day. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Michael. Let, let me ask you a question before we turn over to the Prime Minister. Let me ask you a question uh, regarding the sanctions. Uh, you, from what I understood, you're saying hang tough. There have been some rumors, some speculations in Europe that maybe some of the sanctions should be eased. You're saying not only hang tough, but if there is a new escalation, um, whether this winter or in the spring, maybe attempts to create a land bridge between uh, Donbass and Crimea, uh, for Russian forces, or maybe a revival of the Novorossiya project, there will be new sanctions. What specifically do we have in mind at the moment for the next, potentially next round of sanctions? Well, thank you. Uh, so far, the sanctions, as I think everyone in the room knows, ha have been distributed either in terms of sanctions against specific uh, individuals, uh, uh, which came early uh, in the crisis, and then later against specific sectors of the Russian economy, namely the financial, the energy, and the defense uh, industrial sector. Um, you know, I'm not going to advocate for a, a specific set of sanctions, nor will I telegraph where we might go. Uh, my firm belief is that if there is further escalation uh, on Russia's part in eastern Ukraine, uh, that we need to ratchet up those uh, so-called sectoral, it's a bit of a misnomer, they're targeted sanctions within specific sectors. The goal is to impact Russia maximally while minimizing the impact on the European and American economies and our businesses. And I think so far we've been pretty successful in that. But I think ramping up sanctions in those sectors uh, I think is critical. Uh, the Ru those who know uh, uh, Russia and the Russian elites, uh, you know, I think it's pretty clear they're feeling the pain uh, already. That's, of course, compounded by the oil prices. But especially in the defense industrial sector, this impacts them long term. Uh, the, the sanctions that have imposed on tight oil production, tight gas, offshore, uh, those are having an effect. And, and the leadership of big companies like Gazprom and, and Rosneft, I'm sure, have taken notice. Thank you. Prime Minister, the floor is yours, or the podium is yours. <laughs> yeah, we're discussing, uh, I think, that we're discussing scenarios, scenarios of the development in Russia. And I think that we all understand we came to the position that none of us can uh, keep patience on what Putin is undertaking right now. And that's why we have to discuss those scenarios that uh, with the understanding we cannot accept the reality as it is. It means, I think that all those discussions in Europe, what, we take, what is taking place now, of uh, a waste of co co coexistence, et cetera, et cetera, how to ease, how to find some kind of compromise is absolute, absolutely unproductive. And I don't want, uh, don't want the European Union, and uh, I, I hope the U.S. not, I don't uh, believe this uh, leaders in the European Union would continue to, to discuss these uh, aspects, how to ease those sanctions. Because of the simple reason, we came to the uh, position that the regime already, as we uh, discussed yesterday, already finished uh, singing their song. And now just we have to make up, pave, pave the way out. How to make the, 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 the exit strategy for Mr. Putin. And in fact, there are three scenarios of future developments, as I can see. One of them, we continue thinking, or you continue thinking, or some of you continue thinking that some kind of compromises that's possible and just the system could reform itself and Putin would reform the, the system, etc. And there are some signs for that. And Mr. Putin already offered some kind of, uh, given some signals that he expecting some kind of compromise from you. And he wants to continue imitation that uh, uh, Russia's Putin's regime is a uh, decent one. In fact, uh, he would like to demonstrate that uh, we in Russia have separation of powers, just the parliament, 
Uh, of course, he wants to demonstrate that we have um, freedom of media. I wouldn't say RT, which we discussed in length in the first session, uh, part of the media, but they believe that is uh, some kind of use of uh, implementation of free media. And in Russia, we still have Echo Moskvi, Radio Echo Moskvi. We still have internet portals, etc., etc. And that's what he also wants you to, ex to, ex to accept. And some other features like uh, independent judiciary, and Mr. Khodorkovsky just demonstrated you what independent judiciary is in Russia at the moment. Uh, and uh, uh, another scenario is uh, Putin version 2.0. And in fact, I think there are some talks about that, and um, uh, Mr. Kudrin, for instance, already prepared and uh, is eager to, 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 to become a prime minister, and Mr. Putin keeps this uh, version uh, in his pocket for a near future, so maybe just to uh, have some other changes and to demonstrate to you that he is ready for hum somehow to liberalize at least economic and business uh, environment, but uh, staying strongly on uh, uh, foreign policy and the security issues, and will continue uh, describing to you and blaming you that you unreasonably enlarging NATO and uh, contrary to the promises given, he will continue to blame you. And some of, some of you will continue to believe that uh, there is some kind of feeling of guilt for that, which is absolutely not. Nobody never promised to Russia just not to enlarge NATO, and nobody even given a promise to the Soviet Union. And Mr. Gorbachev recently described that, that there was no such a discussion and the promises given not to enlarge NATO. I could remind you, I'd like to remind you, that Mr. Putin and myself at that time, in the year 2000, 2002, I said publicly that uh, I'd like to believe that my country very soon will be full, full fledged member of NATO. And Mr. Putin said he didn't exclude at that time that. It means that uh, in, in, in general attitude, even Mr. Putin, who is a cynical, unprincipled person, uh, would like to be a part of civilized society. But the only difference is he would like you to accept his regime, as I call it, capitalism for France, as a normal one. But you continue to insist on your principles, on human rights, just universal interpretation, but he said, no, 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 we have Russian interpretation of human rights. You insist on saying just of uh, free democracy and free elections, they say, no, 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 we have Russian specifics, we have now our own interpretation of free elections. That's the difference. And uh, the regime wants to press you, continue to press you, just thinking that everything in this world is purchasable, and he is thinking about only the price. He cannot even understand why he offering you a lot, but you're still demanding more, or just he doesn't understand what you want. He doesn't believe that there are some principles which Western society stands strongly on that. And that, that was a problem with the President Bush at that time, I think it was in 2003, when here in Vilnius, uh, I think it was 2004, uh, Vice, Vice President Cheney came here and delivered a speech and started to criticize Mr. Putin for human rights violations. To the West. Because Mr. Putin already thought at that time the contract already signed. He thought I keep silence of, silence of Iraqi operation, but I got a permission to do whatever I want. And the United States government started to criticize Putin for universal, not implemented universal values, which is written in our constitution and, uh, and the OEC charter. Basket number three. Now Mr. Putin invites you to renegotiate the whole Helsinki uh, Closing <laughs> Act because he doesn't want uh, chapter, uh, uh, basket number three uh, to exist. Therefore, uh, uh, there is no ideological, I would say, uh, strategy. There is a situation and there is a desire of keeping power, whatever necessary for that to undertake. That's why, that's why we have, we have um, uh, 
to be to be strong on principles. We have values we all devoted for. We all devoted to. We have um, uh, leaders of um, uh, European Union countries and uh, transatlantic uh, cohesion, and I think just unity that is the most important point in this case. And uh, I think just uh, keeping a principal position uh, demonstrates uh, demonstrate our uh, moral uh, moral unity and uh, and uh, priority. Uh, I think just all what is going on right now in the economy. Of course, that's first of all, it's a result of uh, Mr. Putin's policy, I would say non-policy for the last 10 years. Uh, after my departure, all reforms were stopped. Russia badly needs reforms. Moreover, Mr. Putin destroyed all features of democratic state and market economy. That was inevitable result. Now we have acceleration of problems because of oil price and sanctions. Sanctions work. The sanctions good and right. Because they targeted to instruments which are in hands of Mr. Putin, not to Russian people, not to the Russian Federation. And we have started all these analysis and discussions to say Russia and Putin are two different things. Two different things. Putin's, Putin's team and Russia and Russian people are completely different. And what Mr. Putin is doing right now is contrary to the long-standing national interests of the Russian Federation. That's why just targeted sanctions against the instruments, they're absolutely okay, and uh, the results already started to feel. If we continue doing this, we can get a success. What the first scenario could be, I would say, pressure on Mr. Putin, mutually, internally, and externally. Internally, we as Russian opposition continue to criticize Putin in all means we have in our hands. And uh, additionally, of course, uh, calling people to go to the streets to protest against aggression and to protest against these results of this policy Mr. Putin pursued. And uh, internationally, as I said, stay strongly on your principles. Our all own principles, our common principles. Stop talking about the desire of lifting sanctions and, uh, and to, re to, 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 to restate your position on Crimea. Uh, stop feel guilty about just enlargement of NATO. That's absolutely a wrong deception. And, uh, and continue, continue to explain to uh, Russian people and to, to yourself that uh, uh, you want to have Strong democratic Russia, which is part of international society, and that's absolutely integral part of Europe. I think that is our future, and we definitely achieve this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mikhail. One question I have before we turn to Lilia. And I asked you this yesterday. Maybe uh, I would repeat it in a slightly different way and see how you, how you think. Is Russia potentially approaching what we used to call revolutionary situation or transformational situation? You know, given the economic conditions, given the, let's say, the contract between Putin and the people, you stay out of politics, but you can make money, that's coming to an end. Uh, in other words, rising expectations which are being thwarted. Is there a, can you envisage a situation which the opposition could benefit and whether this would be a peaceful turnaround or is there potential... Uh, let's say, scenario of, of violence, which, which actually Putin could engineer himself to try and stay in power. Uh, of course, such a scenario, revolutionary development, such a scenario exists. I don't want to believe that will be reality, but uh, they could be. It, of course, it will not happen tomorrow or day after, not in two years, because Russian people just used to keep patience. But uh, if it happens, that will be really, really disaster. That's why my political goal is to prevent this revolution and uh, additionally, simultaneously, to help Russians and Mr. Putin just to build up an exit strategy and to use it. Why I believe that exit strategy and a general such idea could exist in Putin's mind? Because of the simple reason Mr. Putin not Stalin, Mr. Putin is not a general of army who is uh, used to just have a feeling to fight to death. Just they are simply provocators. 
KGB guys, their provocation. And that's what he wants. He wants to, pro to provoke the situation but, uh, and get the benefit of that. How to deal with this? It means, in any case, the cynical analysis, pragmatic analysis of the environment would lead this team to, to somehow semi-happy end for them. It means just let them build up an uh, 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 exit strategy. It means through constitutional manner that free and fair elections. There is an international obligation of the Russian government to have free and fair elections in accordance with the OEC Charter, in accordance with the Charters of Council of Europe. Why don't OEC and European Union would exist and strongly stay on that? We very soon, to, uh, 2016, have parliamentary elections. If we start pressing Putin now on Ukraine, on all on the security issues, on um, uh, human rights aspects, on uh, free and fair elections, in this case we can achieve somehow, and showing him that he can continue to be a president till future elections 2018. In this case, we can, uh, we can start moving, changing the system, not changing people, well, uh, bad guys for, for, for better guys, which will be, will be bad guys just in one year time, but changing the system through constitution. We have everything put in constitution. Putin doesn't implement any single point of Russian constitution, which is absolutely identical to, to uh, OEC and the European uh, Council of Europe charters. If we stay strongly on that, we have, we have all reasons. It's not, uh, I would say, um, uh, testing or just uh, not a taste of, 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 of political choice. Simply take the reports of um, Russian implementation of, uh, of OEC, all three best bestics. We have not all just arguments for criticism and pressure. Take uh, the Council of, uh, of Europe charter, same. That's why we shouldn't shy of being strong on that. We are partners through these agreements. We have a problem of this government. I hope to, if Putin and the whole government just uh, they, they, they stay in power um, temporarily. But I'm saying it back again to what I said. Russia, Russian people, and the regime, it's two, there are two different things. We have international obligations. Current government doesn't implement, but Russia would like to implement those obligations. Russian people adopted this constitution by, by majority vote. That's why we should to, to, to be devoted to that. I think we have uh, a scenario. Okay, thank you very much. Over the key. <laughs> Lilia, over to you.
just want to break up. Or maybe just to beg you, or whatever, but But it's true. The only problem could be that the woman who lives in the place of God would try to apply another thing, and probably they would do, reduce it to get rid of this sufficient and find a new personal life. And it is detected by so many people inside of that and on our side, creating an illusion and prolonging, prolonging very painful and bloody exit to the space of time. So we should be aware and the profound awareness of the illusion state. Let's think about the smoking breath. And second point, and it would be my last point, on uh, the choice. This kind of reality is forcing the West to make. I'm talking not about even Russian opposition, because while Mike was representing the opinion, at least segment of the Russian opposition, of the West. The West is facing a choice of two dilemmas. First one is the accommodative practice. And strangely enough, even in the current situation, you know, we see this accommodation. Let's accommodate Russia to some degree, they're saying. Let's not create Putin. Let's save their faith. And they're jumping like trees from all corners. And they're powerful people. They're powerful leaders. In all capitals, in all Europe, in New Europe, even much more in old Europe. And so many countries are supporting the accommodation line. It's a kind of shadow model, you know? Because, in fact, accommodation line only prolongs the pain for us inside and makes much more threat and dangerous for you outside. So the question is, is it made care? And what kind of interests are behind the accommodation practice? Very important analytical and political question. The second option is, I'm still uh, fighting with myself what kind of English definition I would, I would give it. Transformational, I'm looking at David, he's very good uh, usually uh, in doing this. Transformational strategic purpose or transformation incentive. I'm not thinking about the West helping Russia to do the regime change, because regime change is my just so well, it doesn't give any hope. It simply makes our situation more dangerous. It, it prolongates the pain. I'm thinking about the fact that for the first time, and it's a unique situation for Russia, for the first time, at least in the modern history, the Russian elite, all segments, nearly all segments of the Russian elite, including the military, industrial complex, in order to survive, they have to uh, link themselves to the West. They have to suck to the West. They have to pursue their interests outside of Russia. They cannot close the Russia. They would like to close, uh, uh, close you know, Russia as a population from the West. But they have to pursue their interests outside. So there is a powerful mechanism, a lot of instruments needed on the part of Europe and the West to influence, to have an impact on various segments on the Russian elite, starting with Serbia. Gazprom and ending, you know, Ural, Vagon, March, whatever, because they all need technology, etc. They all need banking accounts, you know, to transfer their money. They all need, you know, educational facilities for their, for their kids and resorts for their families. So it's a unique possibility. Never in the history of the West had such a powerful machinery, central machinery, to have an impact. And, you know, <laughs> strengthen paradoxically, the West has much more means to influence the elite Russian elite and the establishment than to influence the society. So, two few words that are coming to my mind. First, I would echo what Mikhail Fedorkovsky said. I, 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 I don't agree with everything that he said, but at least here is a very strong message. You know, export of the Russian corruption. Yes, other corruption. 
Kazakhstan corruption, the Kraken corruption. But trying to dismantle the laundry machine that the Western community, together with aspects that are losing their reputation, has built in the West. So, so how to dismantle this laundry machine? Stopping input of the corruption from Russia. And second key word is conditionality. Conditionality, which, which will mean probably the Western leaders and the Western establishment, say in the Russian political league, people in London, Russia, and elsewhere, will allow you to pursue their personal interests and allow you to integrate personally into the West in case you behave in Russia and will be ready for change. And finalizing, I want to give a praise, Yana, uh, I want to give a praise to Putin, because in fact, uh, uh, you know, he did something positive. He has kicked over the global chessboard. He, you know, in this outrageous way, in fact, forced the West, the West to see the challenge. He made the situation threaten and definite. And in fact, he's forcing the West and Europe and Europe uh, to make a choice and turn to, to become a normative project again. And a challenge for Russia is a challenge not only for Russia, but for Europe, first of all. And it gives opportunity to Europe to return to Europeanness, to return to value dimension. In any case, my deep conviction is that Russia makes the 21st century very difficult for us all. And maybe Russia is becoming the key challenge of the 21st century, not due to geopolitical consideration, but to uh, the renewed civilization in class. And 2015, 16, 17 could become even more important, more dramatic, and more crucial than 1991, the collapse of the Soviet Union that created so many hopes and illusions. Thank you, Lydia. I can't, I can't but resist asking you this question, particularly because you mentioned it near the end, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union. Could it be mirrored now in a potential collapse of the Russian Federation, particularly if this Putin system is preserved? Yes, it's a question. It's a provoked question, especially considering that we have uh, in Russia the criminal law uh, that would be applied to those who doubt the uh, durability and sustainability of the Russian Federation. But I will risk to respond to you. I don't believe that the Russian nuclear petrol state that I call half frozen empire is sustainable in the longer perspective. I would believe that any transformation of Russia would mean the implosion of the current state that you called Russian Federation, quasi Federation, an emergence of a new state. So, in a new geographic, geographical format. And the current Russian system simply is the uh, one, only one of the stages of survival of the old Russian Empire that started to look for different units in 1917. It's a, you know, a, a patient for such a long history. To a conference about this. There's not much time left. Uh, I'm going to try and stretch it as much as possible. So I would ask you, be very, very brief, introduce yourselves, and please ask a question or make a distinct point. And I'll start from the front row, work my way backwards, please. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, I'm going to take two or three questions and then turn to the panelists, please. Take a couple more of them to the panelists, please. A lady here was next. Lady here was next. One more on this side. No, nope. okay. Go ahead, and then I'll switch to this side. Okay, we'll stop there. Michael, there's one question directly for you, but let's start with the one for the other Michael first. Okay. 
Sure. We're regarding uh, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, TTIP. Um, you know, speaking for the administration, I can't really speak for the Republican Party, but it has broad bipartisan support in the United States. Um, the and I agree with you, this is a strategic agreement. This is not just about spurring growth and, um, and an increase uh, in investment and jobs on both sides of the Atlantic. This is fundamentally about setting the standards for free trade around the world. And we're doing this now, we the United States, uh, both TTIP in the Euro-Atlantic space and TPP in the Pacific Rim uh, area. Uh, and I am confident that Mr. Putin has taken notice of this and that the Eurasian Economic Union is, is his attempt to try and create a space in between uh, that, uh, that mimics what we are trying to do. The only thing is he's doing it in the exact opposite way that we are. What we're doing is bringing down tariffs, harmonizing regulations and standards. He is imposing tariffs for the outside and seeking to redirect trade towards Moscow as a means of political control. Um, thank you. Okay. Michael, back to, uh, back to Ukraine. Uh, yes. Uh, I think it is evident uh, for many that uh, the, the issue of um, uh, Putin's invasion in Ukraine, annexation of Crimea, that is uh, the, the turning point for the whole Russian society. And in fact, even the so-called street coalition, large coalition, which we had in 2011-2012, already just somehow restructured. Uh, extreme lefts left us because they support Putin and his policy on Crimea and Ukraine. Extreme rights left streets uh, and this coalition because they're the same, they support Putin's policy on that. But now, what we are doing right now, and we want to do this, because we started doing, Consolidating the, the central, so consolidating those opposition which answering two questions. One of them, the position on Ukraine in general, and second, European Church, and that's what we have and have our dream, and we believe that such a consolidation would move Russia to the right direction. Therefore, yesterday I said, and today I'd like to to to, to um, uh, repeat it and restate it again that uh, we have those collaborators and supporters and our partners who are answering positively these questions, these points, and answer, give their exact answers on that. Uh, I continue to believe that even today Mr. Khodorkovsky gave an explanation, but he made it in a, in a, in a, in a I would say, um, such a clever manner. He said that he um, believed that he could be part of the, the transitional government. And during this transitional period, uh, prior to the, to the Ukraine for elections, there will not be an issue of um, uh, uh, discussing Crimea and Ukraine. That's what he, he simply left this position. But again, I think uh, he, in general, uh, in general, understands and supports uh, such uh, a general attitude, what I'm describing, and I believe we, we are right. Talking about Mr. Navalny, again, I think that is somehow a populistic answer for the popular question, Krim, Nash. And that's why, as soon as we're coming closer, closer to the general consolidation and answering the question during the, 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 the um, say election campaign, I think that will be much more clear. Today, I, I'm a little bit surprised and disappointed that there is no room for populism now. We have no elections now. And therefore, today, we should take a principled position. Of course, I can, afford, can, 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 can imagine that a little bit of populism could be just one week prior to voting date, but not, of course, just like such a, such a uh, uh, populism like uh, Crimea. But certain things, but not now. Today, just we have a division of society, and we would like to consolidate. Uh, to answer the question and concern 85% of supporters of Putin, it's not a right interpretation. That was a, a sociological poll asking whether you support or whether you approve Putin's policy on Crimea. In this case, right, 85% of Russians said, yes, we think that's right. 
Even those people who hate Putin, they said yes, because they're saying Putin will disappear tomorrow, but Krim not. Because all Russians believe that Krim always, for ages, was Russian. They don't know that only 270 years when Crimea first appeared as a part of the Russian Empire. But before that, other people lived there and continued to live there. And only those people have a right for self-identification in accordance with the UN Charter. But not Russians and not Ukrainians. We already have our states. Independent Ukraine, we have independent Russia. But as a result of European architecture, the Crimea right now is an integral part of Ukraine. And Russia is one of the guarantors of, inter of the territorial integrity of Ukraine. And to be a permanent member of the Security Council, just to behave this way and to destroy the whole architecture, that's absolutely unacceptable. That's why I think it's a principal issue, and no Russian democratic oriented politician can afford to interpret in a different manner. Thank you. Just, just let me add, I'm not so sure you have an independent Russian state because you have a process of state capture by a certain clique. So <laughs> it's a little bit different <laughs> aspect of that. Julia, please, uh, feel free to respond to any of the uh, questions. Well, uh, just a couple of words uh, to add to what Michael has said. Mr. Kubilev, uh, you know, in the 90s, we, the Russian liberals, were so naive. And so, I would say, patrimonial thinking that we thought that Russia would be the first to liberalize, to enter the democratic camp, and the other parties will follow. We were wrong. So apparently, you folks have to think about the transformation there. So other countries will be much faster than we. And apparently, we have to, we have to think in a, a, a rather, I would say, um, in a new way. Uh, not necessarily Russia will succeed to transform Russian Federation, you know, within the current geographical format. We have to think about other possibilities to emerge. This is firstly. Secondly, only crisis and deep crisis can change the mood within the society and within the elite. But we have to be prepared that, uh, you know, uh, the uh, uh, great of red simply bring another regime, regime change, especially when India has an economic and social, uh, social nature. When you fail, when you fail Tatiana with his party, and other liberals fail uh, to combine social and political agenda. At the moment, between 9 and 11 percent, according to Levada polls, probably think that they will support political agenda of the position. Maybe in reality, much less. But, you know, even one million in Moscow can make a change. Which doesn't mean that Russia is trans transferable, changeable, you know, across the whole geographical format. Look at the Caucasus. So we have to think about different patterns of agony, decay, and exit solution. So it will be asymmetrical. And secondly, secondly, what the West could do, the West could do in order to formulate the structure, the impact, Starting, for instance, with a new formula of Magnitsky list. Make it the Kremlin list and put the names at least for 1,000 people living in London, okay? And uh, give them the principle of conditionality. If you want to come back, if you want to continue to enjoy your, your style and, and, and efforts in life, etc., well, change your policy within Russia. Maybe the results will not be immediate. So be consequential. And again, I repeat, Russia never in its history, and no comparison with the Soviet time, has such a relief that is so dependable on new folks. They're totally dependable. But they succeeded to make an asymmetrical dependence. They succeeded to make you dependable on them. So get rid of your dependence on them. Okay, we have, we have five minutes. I'm going to take three questions. Those that jump the highest and shout the loudest uh, are recognized. Please be brief, and answers will be brief as well. James, please. Thank you. Thank you all. Our problem is that 
we are still unwilling to contemplate Russia's defeat without its consent. And our second problem is the, the fact that we still do not have elites that are willing to contemplate a long-term and prolonged struggle over all of these things. Your views, please. How long do you think all of this will take? Good. Short and sweet. Please. <laughs> Thank you. No more questions? Great. Okay. Uh, Michael, I think you'd better answer the, the last question. Okay. Um, I think Russia is going to factor my prediction. You know, I don't know. I, uh, I'm not uh, a political animal. But my suspicion is that Russia will factor uh, into the next election and will be debated. Uh, it is an issue that, uh, in terms of the various uh, global uh, issues that get discussed in uh, American public life, Iran, uh, the Middle East, uh, East Asia, uh, I think the Russia-Ukraine conflict is right there. Uh, rightfully uh, uh, up there with those other issues. And so I suspect that it will actually form a significant portion of the foreign policy discussion uh, in the next uh, presidential election. That is obviously less the case uh, when you have uh, uh, congressional elections uh, or local elections because simply foreign policy does not factor as much. Uh, in terms of public opinion, I think you'll find in the United States uh, very, very strong uh, public opinion in terms of adopting policies that strongly support Ukraine's uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity uh, across the board, uh, bipartisan, uh, all segments of the population. Um, one thing I will say is that uh, as seen from Moscow, I think there is this perception that Washington is obsessed with Russia. Um, we are not obsessed with Russia. There are a, a number Russia is, is, the way it's behaving now, its revanchist policies, its neo-imperial foreign policy is dangerous, uh, and there is a, a rightfully uh, a large amount of attention that is devoted to it. But it is not the only issue, uh, as sometimes our Russian colleagues think it is. Uh, and so uh, oftentimes we find that uh, when they find out that they're not uh, on the top three or top four list of issues that we discuss with other countries, uh, that makes them a little bit perturbed. But... Um, uh, it is important, but uh, it is not all-consuming. Okay, thank you, Michael. Okay, now let's turn to uh, answering James. Michael. Very close to those who sort of created this problem, right? But I'm concerned about the nuclear management of the nuclear arsenal. That's what I'm concerned. And it, it is my impression that this problem is grossly underestimated by all of you, by everyone. Okay? I hope I'm wrong. I don't see this concern. I don't care about Russia being on American agenda. At all. Okay. That, that, I just want to... You, you can continue this conversation afterwards, but uh, we, we really need to finish in a couple of minutes, so please. 
So as I, as I understand, just the question is whether just we can expect Russia's defeat with the Russia's consent. I think just <laughs> not, not, not this way. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that is, that is uh, we're talking about just, uh, of course, uh, as I said, Russia and Putin is two different things. I think we can make, uh, can make just Putin's defeat with the Russia's consent. And I think that is the, the, what I am, I'd like to believe we can build up. And that's why, that's why I think there is a positive scenario on that. And uh, uh, as I said, uh, Putin is not mad guy. He's cynical. And uh, the only thing is he'd like to be viewed as a mad guy. Because what we usually do with, uh, with such and such environment, we just uh, come uh, bringing a compromise. And that's what the regime is now sitting and waiting, uh, just the package of compromises. I think just for me, that's one of them. And as all people describe today, that uh, the whole population supporting just uh, annexation of Crimea. That's why Putin uh, uh, believes that he has a strong basis for that, for expecting such a compromise to be brought to. That's why, that's why just we have an important issue for us to make Putin defeated on the Ukrainian operation. In this case, the whole popularity would disappear within a short period of time. And, uh, and exit strategy, just to show the exit strategy for him, just until the, the massive violation started, I'd like to believe we can uh, prevent that, but until that we can uh, think about normal exit strategy. After that, there will be different ways. I don't want just to even to describe those scenarios uh, because just uh, we already are fed up of revolutions in Russia. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. From put in to put out. And Lilia, you have the last word. You know, I, I'm thinking about uh, one characteristic of our smoothing, you know, in, in, within the expert community. We always ask the question, how long and when? It seems to me it's totally bizarre and unproductive type of discussion. Because, well, I can ask you folks the question, have you ever really seriously predicted any of your crisis? Yeah, you could have guessed. But have you ever predicted the crisis in a very regulated society based on the rules of the game? How could we predict anything that anything might happen in the society without rules of the game? It seems to me we have to prepare ourselves for tomorrow's end collapse and end of agony because we are already late. Okay, thank you very much. On, on, on that note, we'll close. Thank you to the panelists. Uh, fantastic job. And uh, thank you all for being here. And thank you to the organizers. Vladimir Putin and the Kremlin simply twisted history and twisted reality by assuming that Russia was humiliated by the West or else it was not. It was never humiliated. Let me remind you that, in fact, we know quite well that Russia, democratic Russia, was a member of the anti-Soviet coalition. And that was the path of reality in the 90s. Russia was behind the liberation and democratization movements in the Baltic states. Democratic Russia will be so. And it will be instrumental in dismantling the regime. This is what I firmly believe. And I deeply believe, and I believe that I would be joined by you in believing that Russia cannot be changed by someone else or by some other forces. Russia will be changed by herself. With our commitment, with our vision, with our understanding, with our sensibilities, 
And with this note, I would like to end by reminding you what I reminded my colleagues and friends last night. We used to we used to repeat the slogan, which was quite widespread during the springtime of the peoples in the second half of the 19th century. Something that was repeated by Polish and Lithuanian gentry, people who were fighting for their and others' freedom, for your and our freedom. Thank you.